Hello and welcome to Awake Ones. I'm Alexandra Wenman. And I'm Lorraine Flaherty. And today there's just the two of us uh, because Sally's very busy bee doing her branding work at the moment. But we thought we'd use this opportunity to talk to you a little bit about our personal experiences with publishing, with book publishing predominantly, um, just in the hope that um, our experiences might help those of you that are budding writers or who have a dream about getting published is just to share that it is possible and um, we've both had experiences of doing it ourselves and doing it through the publishing world. Um, many of you know that I've had a background in magazine publishing, Lorraine's also been published in many magazines. We have a number of sort of, I guess, tidbits of information that we can share. So Absolutely. So, Laurie, I think we should start by telling the story of your book. and. <laughs> And the serendipitous way that your book got published because it was obviously it was to do with the two of us coming together. I've got this is my book. I'll just put it out of the way somewhere. I'll just put it up there for now. <laughs> yeah. So I, when I was growing up, I always knew that I. Firstly, I always knew I wasn't going to have children, and the standard answer that I would give people with regards to why was that I wanted to write books instead, and I was obsessed with books right from an early age and I always knew that was something that I wanted to do and I guess earlier I didn't know what it was going to be about or I, and I think I thought it was going to be about a spiritual novel of some sort because those were my favorite books to read so when I found my path my my calling and ended up working with hypnosis and then started working with past life therapy I realized that actually that was my topic because the experiences that came up in the past life sessions were so incredible. The stories were so extraordinary. They are like mini films. They are mini like, novels. Yeah, they? so many of them. It's like going to the cinema, we should go through these experiences. But then on top of that, the people's lives that changed afterwards. And so I started to actually uh, note down the experiences that, that were happening. And that became the, the, the starter point of the book and I started doing sessions with people specifically for case studies for the book. So it started to come to life and I was working on it for years. How many years do you reckon you were working on it? I think altogether, if I'm really honest, I, and I wasn't working on it completely, mm. but it was probably about nine or ten years. Do you know, because I just, I was really feeling nine years. Yeah. And isn't that funny, because that's like the divine feminine number. Yeah, and actually nine is, that's actually my number as well, interesting. That's very interesting. Sorry, so we've got to throw a bit of woo-woo. <laughs> it always has to happen, we're on awake one, so the weirdness is going to come out. Ooh, synchronicity. So I would start, and then things would get in the way, whether it was a relationship I would suddenly get involved in, or the career path would go in a different direction, or things just came up that blocked me, and... Even though I totally believed that this was going to happen and that I would be published one day, and even though in my meditations and when in hypnosis I would do, you know, kind of future experiences, I always saw myself holding this book, you know, that this book was tangible, I could feel it, and I knew that it was, it was coming to life. And I would see myself with a female publisher and that the process was really easy and that it was just really natural and that it all just happened, very simply. But of course, every time you speak to somebody about publishing a book, and as happened in my journey, and I have to admit, there was a particular person in my life uh, for a while who said, it doesn't happen like that. Getting a book published is impossible. It's really, really difficult. You will have every door that you can think of slammed in your face. It's going to be really disillusioning, and it will be very upsetting, and you know, it's almost traumatising mm -hmm. because it's hard, it's really hard to make that happen. Somebody else's belief system. And I kept <laughs> saying, that's not how it's going to be because I believe that when things are right and in the right timing and, and when things come together in the right way, that, it, that it's easy. And I'd seen it and I, I firmly believed that it would happen and it would happen exactly as I saw it. But I must admit, there were times when the little worry voice in the back of my head who was listening to all of this stuff and listening to other people talk about how hard it was that I thought, oh, but what if it doesn't happen? Mm -hmm. What if this book doesn't actually get out into the world? 
and that was just such a horrific thought and so there were these two conflicting experiences going on in my world where it was of course it's going to happen and then there's other one going yeah but what if it doesn't really what if it doesn't what if you have just been deluding yourself all of this time and what if it is really hard work so anyway I managed to get that person out of my life because I realized that our beliefs about how the world operates were, were just never going to match and I made a vow when uh, I found myself uh, single that I was going to stay that way until my book was finished and published I made a declaration because I realized that I would easily get distracted because I'm a bit of an all or nothing person and I just decided that was it it was time I had to do it so I just wrote in earnest every opportunity that I got I was just on tubes on trains on you know wherever I was that I was just there constantly writing into this right into the computer and then you and I met <laughs> and uh, we'd started with our meditation group and this was a regular thing and as I'm sure all of you know whenever you meditate and more than one person comes together it amplifies the energy and great things happen so was very much enjoying all of that and I'd made I was doing lots of talks I'd made lots of friends and a lot of these people were people who were published so I was asking other people about their experiences um, including uh, Stuart Pearce mm -hmm. who hosted our meditation group and he'd been published by Findhorn and Findhorn were kind of I don't know heroes really because mm -hmm. Findhorn up in Scotland which is this incredible spiritual community all the things that he'd said about his experiences mm -hmm. and uh, and other people that I knew that had been published by them were really, really positive. Mm. And obviously in the publishing world, some other companies may not be quite so understanding or accepting of, of your message. But I didn't think at that point that I was, I say not worthy, but you know, I just, I just didn't think, I didn't have a contact or I didn't have any real way of, of connecting with them. But someone had told me about um, another company whose name I won't mention, but uh, I sent my book off to this other company and they have various different branches and we're going to talk about self-publishing mm -hmm. in, in a minute. Because I'll try, I'm Irish, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to make this as short as possible. Yeah, you know, she loves the story. <laughs> so <laughs> I sent it off and the company that I sent it to had various different branches where there was a self-publishing branch where you then pay for the, um, the printing and the costs and everything then they had a bit that was sort of a, a combination of the two so you could uh, you could you paid half they paid half and then there was another branch where actually they became your publisher and they came back to me and after various different tests and sending the book out for other people to read they came back and they said we'd like to publish it so as a, a, a full publisher so not as a self-publishing bit and I thought oh amazing so, uh, delighted really happy except that there was a comment made by somebody that worked in the company something to, along the lines of nothing that we haven't seen before mm. and there was a little bit of a sort had of, they read it yet yeah they'd read the mm. synopsis and there was a particular story that I put in which was for me providing evidence that past lives are real because mm. one of my clients had remembered a lifetime in 525 and uh, it was to do with the King Darius, and the only Darius I knew at that point was the one that had been on X Factor <laughs> or something, which of that program was. And uh, it, it was. But you got loads of evidence. There was loads of evidence. Yeah. There was loads of evidence about loads of different characters and the things that had happened, and it was all linked to this King Darius had created a dam, and uh, and, and all of this stuff, all this historical stuff that my client had no idea about, was all verified. It all came back as true. And one of the comments was, well, everyone knows about King Darius and the dam. So I asked loads of people, mm. do you know about King no. Darius? And no, nobody that I spoke to knew. Certainly not in any detail no. either. Not with, you know, like... No, this biblical historical figure from 525. Anyway, that really put me off. I thought, I don't really want to give this thing that I've created. It was like my child. Mm. It was like my baby. I don't want to give it into the hands of somebody that's going to mm. put it down. So... They gave me six weeks to decide, and then we went to Egypt. And Al and I, I never forget, we were sat on a bus and we got chatting about this book and you know what was happening. 
And it transpired that Al knew the woman who I was dealing with, and the woman I was dealing with was absolutely amazing. She was really wonderful, she was lovely. And uh, Al said, oh, you should speak to, you know, to this woman. And I said, oh, I already have. She's the one that's given me the deal. And at that point, my phone bleeped. Mm -hmm. And it was a message from her. And I thought, oh, this is all too weird. This is all too yeah, crazy. we thought it was a real sign. We thought that was a yeah. real sign. Anyway, when we were talking about it, and I said about my discomfort, Al said, well, you should speak to Findhorn. And I said, oh, for goodness. I said, I would love to. But they must get so many synopsises. I can imagine them having thousands landing on their desk every day. And Al said, oh, but I know... Yeah, so I happened to be the editor of a Mind Body Spirit magazine at this time, just synchronistically. So I know Carol, <laughs> yeah. the woman publisher. Actually, weirdly, it was Carol that brought us together because Carol introduced me to Stuart, who introduced me to you. Well, see, so there you Carol, go. if you're watching, yeah. so you are you the Carol. one that brought Lorraine and I together. <laughs> she actually was, was she? Yeah, I wouldn't have met oh, Stuart if she had. So I, didn't, I hadn't even put that thread of it together. So that's full circle. So Al said, I know Carol, let me send her an email. So she emails and says, my friend has written this really amazing book and she's just been offered this deal, but I think you should see it first. So 10 minutes later, I get an email from Carol saying, please send over your synopsis. I've just heard from Alexandra that this is worth looking at. I sent it over and within 24 hours, I had a book deal with Findhorn Press. And all while we were in the magical temples of Egypt. It's just, you know... You can't, and that sort of stuff... You, you just, you can't make up. And I remember, and, and yeah. again, on top of that, no, we were, it was when we came back. Well, because I remember I was back, out, yeah. I was actually... I and was they got out. you straight into the next print run, didn't they? When I spoke to her, she said, there's only one, she said, we would like to take your book, there's only one problem. And I said, what's that? And she said, well, our brochure is going out tomorrow for, you know, the next season's thing. We want the book in there. So you've got until eight o'clock tomorrow morning to do the entire press release, to do all of the, the, the gump and all of the stuff that will go out in the, the, the brochure. Um, can you do it? And I was at a hotel in Southampton because I was doing a training course. I wasn't even at home. I, I mean, I had my laptop, but I didn't have any way of printing this stuff. And I just said, do you know what? I will make it happen. So I stayed up all night. And in the morning I went down into the, the, the hotel office and they printed it all off for me and by 8 o'clock that morning it was in the post box and it, it went off. And for me what was really extraordinary, because you know, I, just, I, I think I just had to, I, I cried all the way into this training course that I was doing because I just couldn't believe what had just happened. It felt like a miracle. Mm -hmm. But at the same time it felt like a miracle but it felt like the most natural thing yeah. in the world as well because it was exactly what I saw. It was a woman and she was lovely and we'd had the most amazing conversation. And I think that she told me I was the fastest, it was the fastest yeah. author that they'd ever signed. And you it was literally from conversation. You didn't need any editing either, did you? No. I didn't change a thing. They didn't actually change one word. No, now that, that is, coming from a publishing background, that is literally unheard of. Like... Yeah. But you, but bearing in mind that I know how meticulous you are, and you are, you know, fine tooth comb, bit of a perfectionist when it comes to your own. Well, yeah, stuff. but I didn't and know. That's amazing. I was at that point, and I think this here's the thing about publishing a book, and I know that this came up for me. Huge fear came up when I got the deal because then I thought, oh my god, what if it's rubbish? I'm not a writer. Like, I haven't. I'm not. An You're academic. not a writer. I haven't been trained. <laughs> I don't have degrees. I don't have. I don't even have. I have no qualifications, and so there were moments of absolute panic when I was suddenly confronted with this deadline that you have to produce this entire book because I had lots of information, but it it wasn't really, I, I guess, structured or mm. put together in a, in a way that I felt was right, and I had to practice what I preach mm -hmm. so I went in and I meditated on it and I got a really clear message from my higher self and my higher self said why are you writing the book and I said well I want to share with people how incredible this work is and, and these amazing stories and my higher self said well what do you do all day and I thought all day I explain to people how past lives work I explain to them what they're going to experience I answer their questions I make them feel at ease and it suddenly dropped in don't write a book have a conversation mm -hmm. Do this as though, this is the same information that you say day in, day out to people. And so instead of writing this kind of, you know, tomb, I did turn it into a conversation. So it became questions and answers. And then the metaphor of the Wizard of Oz 
running through it, which is my favourite story, suddenly aligned in perfectly with all my chapters. And for me, it was like having a conversation with somebody. So I got out of my head this need to be a writer or a professional. And I know that this is a problem that loads of people have when they mm, try to the put books together. The imposter syndrome. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I just wrote as though I was talking to one person. Yeah. And as soon as I shifted into that gear, suddenly it just became the easiest thing in the world to do. And I did go over and over it with a fine tooth comb. In fact, I remember my deadline. I remember that I sent the final document in three minutes before the midnight deadline. I mean, I was literally typing frantically right up to the very last minute before that thing had to go off. So show us the book, because you've got a couple of translations I here. Am. So um, we've, it's been translated into French and yeah. it's been published in So and the, Interestingly, I actually I ran out of copies. <laughs> I, <laughs> when I'd ordered them, I've sold out. So I don't have a copy of the book, but this is the copy. Of we'll flash the, up the book cover yeah, on the yeah, screen yeah. Of, of the healing of past life therapy and I had to negotiate with them to change the title because it was originally going to have a different name but transformational journeys through time and space and uh, Thierry and I had a, a conversation and it was such a wonderful experience because he worked with me completely and I was really nervous about handing this over because I'd spent mm -hmm. nine years working on it and I was really worried that they were going to try and change loads of bits of it and the fact that they honoured me through that whole journey so I was really happy to change the title to work with them on it we met in the middle this was not my idea for the cover I wanted a spire I wanted a yellow brick road and red shoes but they wouldn't let me I get it now that it would have been a bit cliche so I, I trusted I love this though I trusted and when they when they came back with the design actually I I loved it yeah although I was quite aware that there were kind of astrological sim symbols in there and I hadn't mentioned anything and I need to be congruent and then I suddenly realised that it was a missing piece of the book so I had to go back in and, and, and weave in how, how we choose the horoscope that we're yeah. going to have because it helps us and then incredibly it got translated into French which was just really wonderful it was actually oh, amazing say the title no I, I can't because I'm probably going to say it the wrong <laughs> so, but, 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 but it is wonderful and it was a Canadian company but it has turned up in really obscure libraries all over France and various different countries in Europe and I know because I've had clients that have turned up that found them had the book full in his head yeah I had one client who was um, in a library a really obscure little one in some village in France and he wasn't spiritual at all and my book fell out and hit him on the head <laughs> And he liked the cover, so he decided that he would take it and read it, and it changed his life. And he came over from France for a session, and it blew his mind. So it's, you know, never underestimate the power of a book. If you've got a message, your book will do everything that it can. Well, they have their own consciousness. They do have they? their own consciousness. And then it got taken up by an Indian company, so it's out in India as well. So I get lots of messages and, and really supportive and comments from from people out there and people that fly over from India to, to see me and just one last thing and then I'm going to come to your book well, I was going to ask you a question oh it is so carry on but for me one of the most wonderful moments of the whole experience was randomly because I sh you know, there, there was no connection between me and this person that had been very down on me about how the universe works and mm -hmm. you know thinking that all my kind of woo-woo beliefs were just nonsense oh, fabulous and uh we randomly met and when he asked how i was doing and what was happening in my life i said oh i'm just doing some work on the book and he rolled his eyes as he was very good at doing in a kind of oh yeah you know mm -hmm. that old chest that again and i said yeah but i'm actually working on the promotional uh tour because I'm going to California and uh, I'm, I'm doing radio and I'm doing some TV out there and uh, my publisher is um, is you know really uh, keen for me to get out there and, and promote it and he just stopped and I have to really stress here this is really really important because it was not in any way a moment of gloating no what happened for me was that inside I was just so bloody happy that I could now give him, who had wanted evidence and proof, mm -hmm. real evidence that what I was saying and what I believed in was real. Mm -hmm. Like it wasn't just this figment of my imagination, it was like this stuff, you know, when you want something, when you believe in something, when you're passionate about it, when you do see these things, if it's in alignment for you, it's going to happen. And I do remember something in him, he just 
stopped and took a step back and I said because it happened and I said and it happened exactly as yeah. I saw it it was a woman and it was really easy and I was signed overnight and I said and there was no doors slammed in my face in fact I mean I think I'd spoken to three publishers and they didn't like say you yes. gave him a gift in that moment I did because give you him showed a gift. him what, that dreams are possible I think there's probably yeah a part of him that just didn't believe that somebody's dream could come true because in a way he didn't believe that his dreams no. could come true and I do know through the grapevine that major changes happened in his life a few months later, like huge changes that were really positive, mm -hmm. that were really, really good for him, that, that mm -hmm. took him out of a kind of stuck space and mm -hmm. moved. So, yeah, incredible things happen when you do that thing that you are mm -hmm. fully believing in. And, you know, a book is, it's your message. It's your beliefs, they're your... Mm. ideas and everybody's story matters mm. so if there's a book in you just do it don't think about mm. how it's gonna be or you know because again for me when I, I vowed when I wrote my book that as long as it reached one person mm. as long as it made a difference to one person then it would be worth it it mm. would be worth all of the effort all of the time all of the, the, the challenge that went into putting it together. Mm -hmm. I do believe everybody has a book in them. I do too. It's just whether or not they choose to tell their story or not. Exactly. So what was your question? My um, question was, because I know that you're writing the second book now. I am. So how, has there been any kind of differences that you've noticed in the process of writing the second one? Or what's come up for you in writing the second one? Now that you know what the process is for the first one, has anything changed? Has, has has anything surprised you? Yeah, I think with the second one, in a way, what has been challenging is trying to live up to the first one mm. because I've had such positive feedback from the first one. And so... It's your first born, darling. It was my first born. <laughs> and, and so, in a way, it's, that's created its own challenge. And then I had an idea, which was still weaving in a, a metaphor through it. And I think I made it quite hard for myself because I was working with archetypes. And so I decided to weave those in through the, the sort of subject matter and uh, then realised even though I was working with a few archetypes mm -hmm. in my work, that it begged for me to work with all 12, mm -hmm. or all 12 specific archetypes that Jung had been working with. And it's not my expert subject. Mm -hmm. So instead of being able to just get on and write stuff, I've actually had to go and learn, and I've had to research it. stuff. Yeah. So I kind of made it more difficult for myself, but now I've realized I've got about 400 pages, which is way too much for one book. So now what's happened is I'm having to dissect it, and I'm having to take out huge chunks. It's actually turned into two books. So instead of writing one, I think I've actually written two at the same time. Mm -hmm. And then it's a bit like a jigsaw puzzle. So you'll have the Holy Trinity. Yeah. So we'll have a Trinity, yeah. It's a bit like a jigsaw puzzle. When that, I found when I wrote the last book, was what happened. I just kind of brainstormed, I don't know if I'm allowed to say brainstormed, but I just put together mm -hmm. lots of information. And then as I was editing and going through it, I would realise, oh, that bit doesn't belong there. That belongs there. And then the freakiest things would happen because as I read through it, that line would blend perfectly. I mean, mm. it was literally like mm. I had done the follow-on. So it was like I'd written this book all over the place. And then you could segment out bits. And yet all the yeah. pieces, it's like, well, it didn't go there, but it went perfectly, it was perfectly there. So that, my brain was, you know, working in this really kind of uh, holographic, multi-level yeah. layered thing. It's a different way of thinking. It's non-linear, it was, it? it? was non-linear, and then I had to make it linear yeah. to make sure that it flowed for a person That's how to I'm read it. Yeah. Non-linear. So I think, again, I think a lot of people get caught up in the structure and the format. And I think the most important thing is to just write. Mm. To just write and obviously make sure that you've got some way of referencing mm. what each piece is about and then create a structure. You can either, some people need to be very linear, create a structure. But I don't think that's important. I think that can sometimes hold people up. I think just yeah. put it out there and then find a way to put it together afterwards. I think that's absolutely right. I'm, I've noticed that because I did writing for a living yes. and writing about other people's subjects for a living, when it, com when it comes to me sitting down and writing what I want to write about, my brain just goes, ugh. It's yeah. like I'm allergic to sitting at a computer. I, I can't do the 
sitting at a keyboard writing. I mean, I can, but it's just, for some reason, it just doesn't work for me. I almost yeah. feel like I'm being forced to do it or I'm forcing myself to do it. So I write, I, I write on the hop, and I actually read an amazing book by Julia Cameron called The Right to Write, and it, it changed my life because I realized I was already doing this. Yeah. But part of me thought, oh, it's, it's not going to come together as a book if I keep doing it like this. At some point, I'm going to have to sit down at the computer and put it all together, which, you know, I did it did at the end for this one. But I'm writing in the notes on my phone. Yeah. And then you and I did the Michael Breen workshop, yeah. and he talks about that as a technique as well, writing in a small space to get your main point across. Because I think the biggest problem that I've had is getting all this information into a book. How do I put everything I know into a book? I've now realized I've got like at least three books. In the book that I'm writing <laughs> currently, I'm like, yeah. this is not one book. This is about three books. So if it's not th if it's not just one book, then I'm almost finished the first book. So I'm like, wow, I'm nearly finished the first book. But it's like, I think this is all part of this new way of thinking, this whole yeah. feminine evolution. I think that, especially as women, we're birthing books. So yeah. uh, nine years, nine months, I love the correlation. But I find that I'm kind of weirdly simultaneously writing about four books yeah. and some oracle cards and things like that. But my poetry book, this book, just was not ever planned. I mean, I've, I've written poetry since I was four years old. It's just something that I've always done. It's my, it's my medicine. It's, yeah. it's, my, it's just my thing. It just, and I shut it down for years. Or I didn't know if I shut it down for years, but I couldn't access it the way that I used to. As a child and as a teenager, it just dripped from me. And then after kind of going through my one of my dark nights of the soul, it all opened up again. And then before I knew it, like because I'm sitting on the bus writing poetry or I'd get out of the shower, have my phone there, writing po all these poems in the notes on my phone. And then Lorraine and I were going to LA and she went, just do a book. <laughs> just go on Lulu and self-publish. And I actually felt like it was the... It was the right thing because yeah. when I sat down and went, holy cow, I've got more than one book of poetry here. I'm nearly about to put together the second book of, po of pure poetry. Um, but this one, the Poems of Precious Wisdom, was birthed overnight. I sat up till three o'clock in the morning because she went, you've got a book. And it went, boop, and it just dropped in and I just went on Lulu and it was the easiest thing because you can do it through Word. So I just got it all off the notes on my phone, put it all into Word documents, formatted it, chopped it into three sections that just made perfect sense. And then this one wrote the foreword and our lovely friend Steve Nobel wrote, wrote me a foreword as well. And I decided that self-publishing was the way to go because these poems are channeled and I didn't want somebody with an academic, I mean, I have an, an academic background. I, I trained in English literature, and but I didn't kind so of... She, she's actually a proper writer. Yeah, but uh, we, we, we're all proper writers. Do you know what? No. Training in English literature, I will say, taught me nothing. It taught me nothing about writing poetry. No. Um, all it taught me was that everything I wrote that I liked, someone was going to tell me there was something wrong with it and try and shoehorn it into some sort of parameter or... Yeah have a go at, you know, and so I deliberately kept these poems in their pure channel form and haven't changed any of them since they came through. And I'm a rhyming poet, and a lot of people don't like rhyme or um, or they say if you're going to try to write poetry, don't rhyme. And I'm sorry, I think I rhyme very that's, well. For me, that's what poetry is. Yeah, I know, and I think um, all, the, all the great poets rhymed, you know, Whitman rhymed and Tennyson rhymed and... Emily Dickinson rhymed, and um, my favourite of all time, Sylvia Plath. Not all of hers rhymed, but she did use rhyme. And I think that there's something about the rhythm of it that is very fluid and very musical and, and very um, illuminating. But I, this, this came to life just before we went to the Conscious Life Expo in LA in February. I actually had the book sent straight to LA, so when we got there, they were there. So and then I had, man somehow Sally, bless her, managed to get me on stage reading poetry at the Expo. I don't know how that happened. But this, to me, is testament that anyone can do it. And you yeah. can do it before you even realise it. You've got a book. If you just write you know, little messages, you know, I like, I really like the way that um, some of Gabby Bernstein's books are formatted and, and I do like Rebecca Campbell's book because it's a dip in and out book and this is a bit how my Precious Wisdom book is being written, not because she did it that way but it was just already happening, it's more holographic so you can just flick it open at any page 
and choose a um, a poem. I'm gonna actually. I'm just gonna open this and read a poem for That's the viewers. Kind of gonna suggest that she because <laughs> I with this journey with these poems, Al would. To her, I mean, we'd, we'd be having a conversation. Oh, sorry, hang on a minute, and then blah, 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 blah. <laughs> the thing would just appear. <laughs> and you know, and oftentimes when we'd be travelling as well, stuff would come up. And every time she would read it, it would just evoke so much emotion. And that's why I said to her, you have to share these, and you have to share them together. They're like prayers, I think, a lot of them. Or well, they, they, they are to me the healing. They're because they're channeled, it's like a, a little healing. Yeah. Because it does trigger something, I think. It does trigger cool. something, but it was such a, a journey through it as well that moved you from the light to dark to light again. Yeah. And I think this is it. I think that in our world, we often say things that are inspiring, that help to make a difference yeah. for people. And then those words come out and then they're lost. And it's only there in that moment. So to capture something that you can go back to mm. and be inspired by, it's really important. And that's why I encouraged Al to do the book. So do, pick, pick one and read them, because it doesn't matter with that book. Yeah. It, it, every one of those poems will mean something different to everybody, depending on what's going on in their lives. Mm. But poetry is meant to evoke a feeling or a thought yeah. or to change how you feel yeah. and I don't think there's one poem that you've ever written that doesn't do that oh honey no, and, but, and they, but they just seem to get and obviously I'm biased because you know but they are extraordinary they get better and better every time so I can't believe I'm still dripping them like I just and it, but it. it is it just yeah. oozes out of her like it's my medicine I love it now it's my medicine so to be able to share it and you know, it, it, like you said, if it touches one person, then I'm more than happy to share it. And and I and I do think there's something there's something so empowering in doing this yourself as yeah. well in in self publishing because it's mine. No one can change it. No one can tell me that what I've done is wrong. Um, and I've got no one to compare myself to. I didn't want this to fit into a specific genre or a specific publisher's remit. Even with the, the, the actual Precious Wisdom book I'm writing, which is about my healing system and how that came through, and that is a whole other thing because it's taking me a while to write it. But when we're in Egypt, new information has dropped in even yet, and now there's an actual physical experiment that I'm going to do that has to go into the book. So. I've kind of stopped hurrying with it and I'm just letting it, it I'm letting it evolve and percolate so if you're writing a book and you feel a bit stuck it might be that the universe is waiting for the right time or there might be more information that needs to drop in I just think these things shouldn't be rushed they're works of art they're, they're, yeah. they're an, uh, an imprint of the essence of your soul and your message so be gentle with yourself while you're bringing this through because to put your soul on a page is no little thing, you know. It's Absolutely. it's it feels like it's a it's kind of exposing yourself in a way. Flashing. <laughs> um, anyway, I found I, I opened it at a. There's two poems actually, and I feel like I need to read both of these. Uh, so. The first one, and the, in this book, I don't think any of them have titles. But in the new book, I've given them titles. But we'll see what happens. So the first one is kind of about multidimensionality, but whatever you take from it is, you know, what you is your gift. A minute is all I need to live eternities between the two of us entangled in a timeless reverie, gazing endlessly into the starlight of your eyes, worlds within worlds we're whirling, all our lifetimes but a while, planets bright coins in our Midas studded sky. Gold, so gold this moment, liquid light, spun silver, a love that stops all time as we let all the world pass by. And then, now these are in the, these are in the good section. The first <laughs> section is really a bit dark, so this is all obviously in the illuminated love <laughs> section. Um, so the next one is about love again, but it's a bit different. Love is not limited to human emotion. It's a multi-sensory, multi-dimensional, 
multifaceted, multitudinous power portal to sensational superconsciousness. A heavenly hiatus of hypocrisy amid heights of existential, existential ecstasy where mania and mastery meet. I soar on the wings of love and simultaneously throw myself at its feet. I am unworthy and at once deserving. It's all I want and all of me. And best of all, it's free. So that one didn't rhyme quite as much as they usually do. But I, you know, the, I think part of the idea for this was born of a previous idea that Lorraine had. Um, and, and I do remember her telling me the story because her father is also an extraordinary poet and he writes these amazing odes. And uh, so, 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 should we show this book? Amazing. There's a whole story about this book and we might have actually talked about it in a previous episode. I can't remember, but I think that we need to tell this story again because it's just so beautiful. And, it, and, and this book was born of... How, of the research behind this. This book. is like daddy and this is like mummy. <laughs> so yeah, my, my father's seventieth was coming up and as well as writing my own book, I'd always made a promise to myself that one day I was gonna get his work published because he's been prolific. He's written poetry and these stories his whole life, but he's never done anything with them. So surreptitiously I managed to get hold of Surreptitiously Syrup. Syrup. Honey, darling. Honey darling. But I managed to get hold of a copy of a load of the poems and discovered Lulu. That's when I first came across this as a, a platform. And as Al said, it's one of the easiest things. I thought it was going to be really difficult. There are a lot of self-publishing companies out there and we've had not, well, kind of personally, we contributed to another mm. book, didn't we, called Thresholds, yeah. which is a very inspirational book about lots of people's challenges and, and key moments we're going in to interview life. robin and simon at some point and we're going to we'll, we'll talk more about that so we both contributed chapters to this amazing book that's out there but they worked with one of the self-publishing mm. houses that you pay for them to you know put put the whole thing together and we have to say that it was the most traumatic it's like teeth, it, it was the most excruciatingly painful experience and and bless simon and robin they were the ones that were bearing the brunt mm. of it all because we were just sort of waiting to see what was going to happen but with lulu you have complete control mm. it really is just a template and you are able to go on there and choose your cover, you choose your own choose style, your you choose the size, and then you literally just upload mm -hmm. a, a Word document and they provide your ISBN and then they upload it to Amazon and to Barnes and Noble as well, yeah, I think. Barnes and, Noble, yeah. and so it, it's a, a global distribution and it's pay on demand. Mm -hmm. So they only, or print on demand. And so you can then order as many copies as you want, you decide on the price and then you pay, I think you pay half mm -hmm. as the, 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 the publisher for the books and then you just have a link, a code and people can go on and buy them. So I got hold of the, the poems and I put this thing together and I didn't tell my father. And uh, with my sister, we created a book launch in the local bookshop in Clifton, in Connemara, his, his uh, small town that he lives in on the west coast of Ireland. And this was all done without his knowing so we did a, a we had to try and keep him out of town while we de decorated the, the the whole window display and we invited lots of friends and family and the national press because you know local oh man God, does good he would have loved it. and i must we had to create a bit of a story to get him and my mum dressed up and out of the you know out of the house we said there was some event that was going on in the town and the funniest moment was when we walked past the shop and my sister pretended that there was a book that she wanted to find in the bookshop to make my parents look in the window. And there's the book, and then there are all these rosettes with pictures of my dad, you know, and Michael Flaherty. And my mum said, oh, Michael, look, someone with the same name as you has done a poetry book. See, you should have done your own, Michael. Look. <laughs> God, that's what a coincidence. Did your mum know? No, I don't know. Like, my mum's terrible. She would have revealed. She so she's like, oh, what secret. a shame. This is your, someone with the same. Some name. other Michael Flaherty. And uh, anyway, at a certain point, my dad stopped and he was really looking, and you could see some part of his brain was starting to 
twig and he looked up and he said, that's me on that, <laughs> on that rosette. And we said, yeah, look inside. And then there were all his, all his people, you know, clinking champagne. And uh, so it was just a read one. It was, it was just magical. And for me, to, for me, my sister, to be able to oh, produce that for him. Gift. So I'm just trying to find one. Um, because some of them are quite oh, long. Okay, yeah. all right. So God's Own Land. It's a long time since I've read some of these. So a grey rocky tableau lies all around, lichen covered rocks, whipped by wind and rain, sculpted by centuries of wear and tear, purple mountains soaring into the air, oblivious to all who venture there. On rain-soaked days, a desolate sight, the sea laced under a veil of misty rain, while arching over this craggy domain, a vibrant rainbow glows like a mirage in the evening light. Drawn to the colour and austere beauty, a world depleted of sound where your ears tend to pop, timeless beauty dictating every movement, absorbed in cloud formations, forming around hilltops. On those blue, green, cloud-topped, misted mountains, streaked with shades of rust and copper, limestone rocks lay slumbering on this grey, undulating, lunar landscape. Nature enduring every test, on this ancient landscape that God has blessed. Everything you experience about the West makes you feel you've become an honoured guest. Oh my God, the West of Ireland needs to hire him for their ad campaign. <laughs> and that's him writing about his local hometown. That's so that is, beautiful. The, the area around. He's got, is, it, and she's called it Away With The Words. And yet this is the thing, he does, he, he recited one at your birthday. Yeah. He recited a, one of the long, really long odes. And I was just sat there captivated because he's so gifted. This one too does write some poetry too, though she'll never admit it, but she's writes very, very beautiful have, poetry. I have my moments. But, but and again, this is the thing with, with writing books is that it is then something that is eternal. Well, you know, it's a treasure. To it's a, keep. It is a treasure to keep, and it's it's a gift. So, I think that people there are so many ways you can do it. So, obviously, going with the publisher, you know, the thing, the support that you get there is that obviously they have marketing departments and they have people that can support you and Most help of them you on do, the journey. Although I have to say, some of them have really cut their funding. Yeah, the thing about the new that, paradigm. But that's what I was mm. going to say is that you will find that a lot of the time. Publishers will expect you, whether it whether you go with self-publishing or even with a publisher, that you know it's not like the old days where you mm. you know that they would put you out there yeah. and promote it. You with social media now, you're going to do most of it yourself anyway, yeah. and social yeah. media really is the the route that you're going to get the message out there. And yes, I mean my experience with Fintorn was just you know it was just incredible. They they were amazing, and the fact that they didn't change my book was amazing that, distribution too. That, that was such yeah. a gift. But don't let that hold you back. If you have a dream, you, by all means, go and you know if you have an instinct or an intuition about something, go to the publishers. But if that doesn't work, do it yourself. Yeah, do it yourself because. It's really important, I think, to share mm -hmm. whatever is within you, whatever creativity, whatever messages, and because there are so many different ways that you can do it now, mm -hmm. write it, and the right way mm -hmm. to get that book out there will come. The right people will turn up, the right experience. I mean, with Lulu, I've, I've got some children's books that I've been writing. Oh yeah, on that note, don't be afraid of making mistakes as well, because I do have a children's book that was published and I went with a publisher and part of something that happened was I think I birthed that, that book a bit too soon but I had signed an original contract because my children's book was part of a series and it was always meant to be part of a series yeah. and it's a series on the Archangels for children it's and amazing. the contract was for the first four books in the series which was Archangels Ariel, Jophiel, Michael and Raphael and there were meant to be two of the, the we know angels don't have gender but there were meant to be two more feminine and two more masculine and it was meant to come as a set a little bit like the mr men but with angels 
And so I'd signed the contract for the first four books, but when the publisher, when I'd sent in the first book, the publisher put out the first book and refused to publish the next three books until they'd sold a certain amount of the first one. And the first one we published was Ariel, and if I'd known that, I would have put out Michael, because he's obviously the better known oh, no, yeah. angel. And so they would kind of reneged on the contract a little bit. I'm not going to name the publisher, because they were lovely, they were always really nice to deal with, but it just wasn't what I'd hoped it would be. And also, there was no promotion, I had to do it all myself, and then I didn't get any royalties at all because it was until I'd sold a certain amount of books, like something like 10,000 books, you don't get any royalties. So I felt like that contract just wasn't working for me. And so uh, how long ago, it was about six months ago, I managed to get out of that contract. And so now I have my books back in my possession and all my rights to my books back in my possession. And Gemma, uh, Gemma Bliss, <laughs> as she calls herself, um, is uh, used to be my deputy at the magazine and she's an amazing illustrator and kundalini yoga teacher and she did all the pictures for my children's books so we've decided we're going to self-publish together so gems and i are working on those currently and then we will be putting them out as a set so watch this space Yay. but again it's don't be afraid to try things make mistakes and trial and error you know always remember the universe has your back yeah. for a long time I, I i was a bit worried that i wouldn't get out of the contract and i'd never get my book back and and that the, the rest of the series would never get published but i do believe in divine timing and i do think that you know if you've got an amazing dream it, it, it's like it will come through at the right time in the right way you know we all have a we all have something to share we all have gems of wisdom to share so just Absolutely. just go for it but the one thing i will say is that if you are going to self publish please 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 get somebody to read it first yes <laughs> fact check it make sure you do all the proper and get do mm. see if you can find somebody who has a really good eye mm. who can pick up on things because I mean, when my book was getting ready to go in, I mean, I went over it and over it and over it with a, a fine-toothed comb. I mean, I literally... And what, one of the things that I did was I read it out loud mm. because after a while, because they're your words and you become so used to seeing them that you become blinded. Why did I pick up one? There was something that was like... There a, was a word. That I, th I don't know which word it was. There was a phrase. There was a phrase. You blown away. You blown away. I'm blown away. I'm blown away, <laughs> I'm blown away by everything. And when, when Al pointed like, it out to Are you, you trying to blow up your book? <laughs> oh, my God. I must have said I'm blown away about 300 times. So I had to go in and delete all of that. Literally, I, I think I left two of them in there. <laughs> it is something that I say. Yeah. But I said, just open the thesaurus. It needs to be, and yes, for, and obviously yeah. your book needs to be your language and your way of doing things, but there's nothing more frustrating for the reader than repetition like that. Yeah. I, you know, I was editing the, the last book and somebody said to me, you do know that you've used the word just yeah. quite a lot, and it's, I use it in my language, I'm just doing this, or I'm just doing that, but that's okay when you're having snippets of conversation with somebody, but not if somebody's reading that same word. And as soon as it was pointed out to me, I was able to go through it and say, oh yeah, okay. Just and do a find and change on word. It's easy if you think you've repeated yeah. yourself a lot with little phrases. Yeah. And the other thing that I will say, and as I, because I write as I think, I write as I think, I write as I speak, and then I have to go back over it and then just delete huge chunks. <laughs> all the this and that and just additional words that you don't, less is more when you're writing. Mm. If you can make the point in 10 words, but you've done it in 15, yeah. you know, cut, cut out that extra five. Yeah. Less is more for sure. Succinct. Be succinct and yeah, yeah but and, and I can't stress enough and get a few different people to read it, mm. to, to get an idea because if you're asking people that you know that love you, they might just be a bit polite. Mm. And you're much better off to have somebody that will give you really honest and constructive feedback mm. because it's better that you actually yeah. und you, you see those bits before you put it out there because once it's out there, it's too late. Yeah. And also make sure this is um, yeah, from a professional point of view and from a legal standpoint, be careful of libel, be careful of slander, don't say anything about somebody, yeah. um, you know, any, any personal information unless you have their express written permission. Um, also, if you quote anyone, you need to make sure you have permissions, make sure you know Absolutely. everything that you need to know about rights. If it's not your original words or your original work, make sure you know about rights because you don't want to be stung with plagiarism suit. Um, 
And just remember that it's you have your own message. You don't need to copy anyone else's or, or be like anyone else. Do your Absolutely. own, do it your own way. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think of um, other things, and and don't be afraid to promote yourself either. Like you'll find um, when I used to work in the magazines, we loved people that you know had a book and would let us either publish segments of the book with a credit you know to help promote it um i think i'm getting some of my poetry published in kindred spirit soon or on my body spirit mag and i've given them permission to use it with a credit for the book things like that because obviously the magazine industry you know they have a budget that they that they need to stick to as well so any any free content they can get they love so don't be afraid putting yourself out there and approaching people for articles and um, permissions to, to, to use your work as long as you get full credit and there's a, yeah. a link to, to buy the book or to buy your work as well. Absolutely. And the best thing in my experience that you can do to promote the book, other than social media, obviously, which is the, the, the go-to thing, is get out there and do talks. Yeah. Nothing is better than being able to just go out and share with people your journey and your message from the book and Certainly most of the sales that that I created were through that because if you have a message that's inspiring for people mm -hmm. They want they they want something of you yeah. You know you do a talk and, and people really enjoy it and and they will want mm -hmm. to, to have a piece of you They will want more mm -hmm. and so your your book really is your kind of you know, in a way, it's like your calling card. Mm. It is your message, but yeah, it's it is like your child. So you know, be proud. Go out there and uh, and I just I just realised there are little hearts that I, I haven't know, seen. I little them. heart shapes on there. There's an octopus there. Look, there spreading the word. There is. Love that. There is. So yeah, I think I think ultimately the message is, do it. Yeah. Just start just it. Do it. Do it. And uh, obviously, if there's any help that that we can give if anybody has questions or you know anything else that that we can help with mm -hmm. with with regards to the book just you know yeah. get just in contact comment below the video or and likewise uh if you have any uh ideas for topics that you'd like us to cover on awake ones we're always open to hear from you we love we're, we're building a bit of a community now around the show we love it we love hearing your feedback we love hearing from you guys um yeah, we really do we we you know anyone that you would like to recommend for interviews or topics or anything like that any feedback um yeah we love hearing from you guys so you, you can follow us on instagram we're also on facebook and uh, obviously here on youtube so yeah on that note anything else that we need to say about publishing any questions that you have we can always do a part two on this as well eventually because um we, and we are thinking of doing some workshops yes at some point as yeah well. some, we will be doing some writing some writing workshops, workshops just because i think what's also really brilliant is being with like-minded people so mm -hmm. when when we've done writing workshops before just being in that it's a bit like meditation mm -hmm. if you're in that space where other people are being creative it just gives permission for the information to flow so many people talk about writer's block but when you're writing just to for the sake of writing and you get into the habit of it uh, then that is it's really really yeah. helpful it's a good thing just to try like wild writing or what julia cameron calls morning pages it doesn't have yeah. to be done in the morning but just anytime just sit down and write stream of consciousness i yeah. mean that's how my poems were born it's just stream of consciousness but you can come up with the most amazing you might write about just what you're observing around you or how you're feeling just the first thing that comes to mind just write could be about your dreams when you wake up and you might just find that you have some little nuggets of wisdom coming through or you might find that you unlock a gift for writing in a particular way or about a particular subject matter. Another good thing is to start a blog and then just write little snippets and then before you know it, you've got whole chapters that you can put together. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but have fun with it most yeah, of all. Just absolutely. explore and have fun. Don't put pressure on yourself, I think. That's where writer's block comes from, is the pressure to perform. To get it right. or, yeah. Yeah. And my, my, my main key point as well is write for yourself, do it for you and don't think about who's going to be reading it because that can also add extra pressure. If you don't think about who's going to be reading it and you just do it as a creative process for yourself, then you will find also that you unlock some magic there. So, so just do it. Just do it. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> on that note, thank you so much for watching. Thank you for watching.